Um, so what I want to do uh, kicking off is very briefly talk about what I uh, understand by cultural evolution theory, maybe what um, the cultural evolution lot understand by uh, cultural evolution theory very briefly, and then I'll spend most of the time talking about a series of lab experiments uh, with human participants that I've done over the last few years and a few other people I'll mention uh, their work as well, testing the assumptions and the predictions of cultural evolution uh, theory. Okay, so it's important to start off with um, uh, clear definitions, so there are hundreds of definitions of culture across different disciplines. The one that we use in cultural evolution is typically a very simple one like this from Richardson and Boyd. Cultural <coughs> information capable of affecting individuals' behaviour that they acquire from other members of their species through teaching, imitation and other forms of social uh, transmission. So things that we uh, colloquially called beliefs, attitudes, skills, can go up to institutions, um, uh, attitudes, things that we acquire from other individuals. Uh, and then the next key question is what is evolution? And again there are many different ways of defining evolution. Um, textbook biology definition is changes in gene frequencies which immediately prevents any um, analogy to cultural change but we're interested in uh, a theory of evolution, an idea of evolution that you can apply to culture, to socially inherited things. So the way I like to think about evolution in a very simple way, actually the way that Charles Darwin laid out in The Origin of Species, because he didn't know about genetics or uh, genetic inheritance or genes, is uh, that it's inherited variation that changes due to various processes. So we've got some variation in a population, We've got uh, some kind of uh, inheritance process causing persistence of that variation, and we've got various processes that change that variation over, uh, over time, over successive generations or just uh, through time. So when we're thinking about genetic evolution, the variation is in allele, in, in, in genes, and the inheritance is genetic through DNA replication and biologists have various processes that they use to explain evolutionary change, change in this variation over time. So selection is the one that Darwin talked about, but also drift, uh, mutation, recombination, migration. Some of these increase the frequencies of traits, some of them introduce new variation um, uh, in, in, various, in various ways. So this is kind of a kind of abstract uh, picture, or well, the, uh, the, the idea of genetic evolution fit, uh, laid on to the abstract idea of evolution on the previous slide. So then when we start talking about cultural evolution, we have cultural variation, um, variation in ideas, uh, attitudes, beliefs, skills. Uh, we have cultural inheritance through not genetic inheritance, but social learning through imitation or spoken or written language or various other social learning mechanisms. Um, and then the question that has occupied uh, lots of cultural evolution researchers really since the 70s and 80s is what are the processes that change cultural variation over time, um, uh, over from generation to generation or uh, persisting through time. So I'll run through a few quick ones that have received attention in the literature. So we can have quite selection-like uh, content or payoff biases. So in language, for example, some grammatical rules are just intrinsically more memorable or understandable. So you can show that regular uh, past tense forms like chided, the past tense of to chide, um, has been increasing in frequency. Um, this is uh, from 1700 or so up to the present day, um, and irregular forms of some verbs uh, like chid or chode have been decreasing in frequency, so this is just easier to remember and so um, it tends to spread. Or some kind of uh, what might call payoff bias, selective forces uh, increasing the efficiency of traits over time, so the fork, history of the fork is quite a nice case study for this. You can show forks started off just as prong things and then people figured out that if you add prongs then it's more effective uh, uh, to eat with forks. This is a Bluetooth connected fork you can buy in the States which vibrates if you're eating too quickly. I'm not sure whether that will catch on, it's probably too complex uh, for people, but the idea here is that it's kind of selection, like you've got the accumulation of modifications uh, with each step uh, slightly uh, more effective than the previous one. So very selection-like selection uh, uh, processes. 
Uh, but we also have things like uh, what's uh, uh, called model-based biases, where you're copying things not just based on their intrinsic efficiency or complexity, but based on the characteristics of the person who exhibits those traits. Um, so people uh, like Joe Henrich talk about prestige bias, where we copy people who are, or well, copy the traits, the uh, cultural knowledge of, or traits of people who are particularly high status or high prestige. Um, this, in many cases, can be an adaptive thing. Sometimes it goes wrong, like when advertisers uh, get people like David Beckham to drink Pepsi, and people then um, uh, are more likely to buy Pepsi because it's associated with a high prestige uh, person. Uh, probably Pepsi didn't have anything to do with David Beckham's actual success, so um, this is kind of um, the prestige bias going wrong. My favourite is Ronaldinho, the footballer advertising photocopiers. I'm not quite sure what the connection is, but it seems to work. We seem to copy people based on their prestige. Uh, we also have uh, frequency dependent biases, the most common of which is conformity, uh, but you can also have anti conformist bias. So if everybody's using Macs, then a kind of good rule of thumb is you buy a Mac as well, irrespective of how good Macs or PCs are. You just use the frequency of a behavior in a population uh, or in, in a group as a guide as to what uh, trait to adopt. Uh, we have migration, um, which kind of brings in archaeology, perhaps, uh, in particular, um, where migrants bring in new um, cultural knowledge, cultural traits into a population. So there's lots of work in archaeology, for example, on uh, the introduction of agriculture from the Middle East into Europe, or uh, horse, horses, um, uh, horse, horse riding from the, the steppe. So here you've got um, uh, the introduction of novel cultural practices uh, with migrants. Uh, we have mutation or invention, analogous to mutation in or genetic mutation. Uh, this is um, Alexander Fleming discovering uh, penicillin, so it can be accidental in that sense or more intentional. I'll say a bit more about that later. Um, and uh, what um, is most interesting is these non-selective uh, biases. So we shouldn't get too hung up on selection and whether um, evolution is selective because there's lots of work looking at uh, more transformational non-selection-like processes. This is a nice study by Tom Griffiths at Berkeley um, where he did, ran transmission chain studies, Chinese whisper-style experiments where starting off um, different chains, people had to, were given an X value and had to guess um, or uh, had to say what the Y value is. So they had to guess a function, basically a mathematical function. They were given one of the variables and had to um, give um, uh, what the associated uh, number was um, uh, for, for that function. And some of the chains started off with so Y equals X linear functions, some with negative um, y equals minus x functions, some with more complex uh, functions, some with random functions, and each step they started off being rewarded for this function, but uh, this the next each step used the previous pairs, the previous generations pairs as a training set. So they kind of learned from each generation to each generation, and over time all of the chains transformed it into a linear x equals y function. So people kind of have an intuitive, um, uh, intuitive understanding of or intuitive expectation of what different uh, values should uh, look like, and they gradually transform any starting point into an intuitive endpoint. So this is very non-selection, like almost transformation. You can call it Lamarckian if you like. A transformation due to individual modification. So this is also um, uh, perfectly, um, uh, perfectly uh, fine for these evolutionary models. So that's the kind of very brief sketch of cultural evolution theory. You've got variation, you've got inheritance through social learning, and you've got various processes that change that variation over time, just like biologists have various processes. So some are quite analogous to the genetic evolutionary case, like these selection-like content biases or migration or drift. Some are quite unlike anything you see in genetic evolution. So the argument is not that culture evolves in exactly the same way as genetic evolution, but that we can use this general, some people call it population thinking framework that Darwin introduced to understand cultural change within a quantitative uh, scientific framework.
Um, so there's been a bit of an explosion in cultural evolution research. So Cavalli, Schwarzer, and Feldman and Boyd and Richardson uh, published two influential books laying out basically what I just presented, um, but um, in a, a mathematical uh, population genetic style form. And then there have been quite a few books recently, and we've just uh, formed a cultural evolution society that many people are involved with, so we think we have 1,700 or so members and our first conference um, in September. So uh, it seems to be gaining traction across different uh, disciplines. Uh, so as well as uh, theoretical models, so ha ha how do we, um, how do we uh, actually research cultural evolution? There are theoretical models, like I said, the, the first um, books, Cavalli, Swilzer and Feldman and Boyd and Richardson were very maths heavy. It was creating models, understanding the evolution or the conditions under which these kind of biases evolve. So when does conformity evolve? When does prestige bias evolve? And also models of the um, population level consequences of these biases. So if you have conformity, how does that change? The uh, between or within group variation over time, how do, um, has it changed the spread of traits into a population? So very uh, theoretical models, and we'll hear from people like Jeremy later um, uh, about uh, modeling cultural evolution. At the other side we have uh, so-called real world, um, uh, lots of real world studies, ethnographic studies, archaeological studies, historical methods that again we'll hear about over the next two days, uh, where you have real data set data produced by real people um, and you're again looking to see if you can detect these different biases or um, uh, kind of macro evolutionary um, part of the discipline also builds phylogenetic trees of things like Little Red Riding Hood, this is the work of Jamie Tarani where you can reconstruct languages or folk tales here. Um, so for the rest of the talk, I'll talk about lab experiments, which I think fit um, kind of cosily in between theoretical models of these processes, so what could happen or what logically is possible, is plausible, and the real world, where you're actually observing real life, whereas lab experiments combine uh, the, the control that you have over conditions, uh, the, the, the internal validity that you have with models, and the external validity because you're actually getting people into the lab um, and testing their actual uh, behavior. So we're interested in, do people actually learn in the ways assumed in the models, all those different ways of learning from each other, and can we recreate historical or ethnographic patterns uh, in the lab? Always remembering that Experiments don't tell us anything alone, they should always be used with models, with observational studies, with historical studies along a continuum of internal validity uh, to external validity. Okay, so the series of studies that I've been doing over the last uh, few um, years uh, uses this uh, task, which I call the virtual arrowhead task, where people have to design an artifact and we try to make it not quite as artificial as other um, experimental setups, try to make it first visually engaging, but also we try to tie it to actual an actual real life case of real life phenomenon of uh, cultural change, so we can say something about the real world, but also something generally about how people learn from each other. So before I uh, talk about the um, details of the experiment, so this was uh, started with archaeologist Mike O'Brien, who's uh, an archaeologist at the University of Missouri in the States. And he's done lots of work with actual arrowheads, so we're talking about um, the tips of arrows or sometimes spears. Um, there's lots of, this is kind of the, the, one of the most common archaeological artifact that you find across North America in particular. Um, and there's quite a lot of work quantifying um, <coughs> you know, the different dimensions of these arrowheads. Recently, lots of phylogenetic work reconstructing the spread of these arrowheads across uh, the North American continent, um, and people are beginning to work out how they change over time and tying uh, pat macro evolutionary patterns to these micro level biases about how they're learned from person to person. So we're not quite um, uh, in the experiments, not quite simulating anything uh, specific, although I'll talk uh, a bit about that at the end, but we're trying to use this as a kind of background rather than some completely artificial um, uh, thing in an experiment, we're trying to tie it to something that archaeologists are uh, interested in to start with. So in the experiments we have uh, so individual uh, learning conditions, so uh, we're interested in comparing how people learn on their own 
compared to how they learn from others. That's the kind of social learning versus individual learning distinction. And then when they learn from others, who they learn from, how they learn, etc. So this is a video of a uh, individual learning condition. So here, participant is playing it uh, with no opportunity to learn from anybody else, no possibility of copying. Just have to use um, trial and error learning um, over successive trials to figure out what a good arrowhead is. So you can see they can change the height, width, and thickness, which are quantitative, uh, continuous traits from one to a hundred. You have one of four different shapes, one of four different colors, and then you go on a virtual hunt and you get a score in calories or bits of bison. So obviously we're ignoring all of the kind of motor aspects of making, actually making hand axes and we're ignoring the rich social structure within which, um, sorry, uh, arrowheads not hand axes, arrowheads are uh, made and, and passed on and we're just focusing on basically the design of it and how you learn different designs from others. So it's not a complete simulation of um, arrowhead uh, cultural evolution but we're using it to home in on certain specific uh, things. But the interesting thing is comparing this kind of condition to social learning conditions where we have lots of people in the lab all playing it at the same time, usually in groups of five or six, and all, it, all the computers are networked up and uh, we can control who they learn from, all the information that they see, and in this condition everyone can see other players' scores up to that point, and they can choose to copy another player, in this case they're copying, as you might expect, the highest scoring player at that point, and it shows them the other player's values in red. I think this person has copied almost exactly, there's a bit of variation there, and they've done very well out of copying. So we're interested in you know, who do people copy, in, we can manipulate, we can introduce conformity or different biases, when do they copy rather than uh, learn on their own. And the so the interesting uh, thing that we can do in experiments that we can't do with real um, artifacts um, is play around with things like fitness functions, so what makes a good arrowhead. You can guess about that based on ethnographic data, but in the archaeological record it's always going to be hidden, whereas in experiments we can be a bit more quantitative and manipulate this. So the overall score that people see in the experiments is generated or the sum of fitness functions from the three continuous attributes, the height, the width, and the thickness, each of which is bimodal, so there's a super optimal, global optimum uh, for height, for width, and for thickness, but there's also a local optimum here. Um, so if you have, say, a height of 22 or so, you've got the highest possible score from height. If you've got a score of about 70, you've got a local optimum. And then shape is a kind of step function there. There's one really good shape one not so, uh, slightly not so good uh, shape, one medium shape and one terrible shape. And then we add a bit of random noise so that it's a bit more unpredictable, um, simulating sort of randomness in feedback. Uh, and you'll notice color we decided was uh, neutral in the experiment. So if you combine those together, you get a kind of multimodal adaptive landscape. So if you've got all three global um, optimum values of the continuous attributes, you've got I don't know which one's highest, but maybe the highest possible peak in the landscape. If you've got one global and two local, you're at a lower peak. If you've got all three local, then you're at the lowest peak. But the interesting thing is that they're peaks. So even if you're at the lowest peak, then if you move slightly your arrowhead design, then your score goes down. And we don't tell participants anything about these multimodal adaptive uh, landscapes. Okay, so in these first few uh, experiments, we wanted, we had a period of individual learning, so the green ones here, uh, sorry, 30 hunts or trials um, per season, usually three seasons. Uh, these green first 25 hunts was purely individual learning, you saw in the first video, so no opportunity to copy any other player. And the last five hunts was uh, or success by social learning, again as you saw in the second video, you could copy others given the other people's uh, scores up to that point. And we found that uh, in these first few experiments, uh, so this is score, the black line is the individual controls who did the whole thing um, on their own with no social learning. The blue line uh, are the participants who did it, as I showed on the previous slide, in those last five hunts they could copy other people given their scores. And you can see 
this uh, success biased social learning, uh, social learners significantly outperformed uh, individual learners in this multimodal adaptive landscape. So once this is kind of an advantage of or benefit of social learning in this situation, um, uh, it lets you exceed what you could achieve by individual learning alone. Um, it's, we checked obviously that people were copying others, so 93.1% were viewing another player at least once during this period, and of those, the vast majority viewed the most successful player. In this version, we're kind of leading people on because that's all they could see. Uh, later on, we uh, manipulated that, but they were doing as we expected. And various analyses showed that they, this was because of this multimodal landscape. So at this point, um, the, in, they, the uh, participants had all converged on different peaks in the landscape, and then letting them copy other players allowed people who happened to have found low fitness peaks to jump over to the higher peak, which had been found by the more successful player, who by definition had a higher score. And then we can play around with the landscape, so the orange line here, we manipulated it so there's now a unimodal landscape, just one single best possible arrowhead design. Uh, these, the orange people are purely using individual learning, so no social learning at any point, and they uh, ended up with a score just like the social learners. So the point here is that social learning isn't always adaptive, isn't always useful, crucially depends on the shape of the adaptive landscape that determines the effectiveness of whatever you are uh, copying. And again, you know, these kind of things we can do in experiments, and at the end I'll uh, make some insights, or try and draw some insights about how we can use this kind of manipulation to inform archaeological work where all of this is uh, kind of hidden and unknown. Uh, we can also play around with things like the cost of individual learning. So in this uh, version of the experiment, we had participants pay, they had to pay 200 calories in order to change their arrowhead. So every time you change height, a height or width or any of the boxes along the top, you have to pay 200 calories out of your running total of calories. Um, and that made social learning even more adaptive. You can see a much bigger um, effect size, a much bigger gap between the social learners here. So this is a straightforward uh, test of various models that show that social learning is particularly good when um, there's a cost to individual learning as well as when it's difficult, which is what the multimodal landscape assumption uh, did. So I'll, draw, I'll gradually add the conclusions as we go. So here most participants employ success bias social learning when this is adaptive. For example, when individual learning is hindered by these multimodal landscapes where people can get stuck on suboptimal peaks, uh, or it's just artificially made, uh, made costly. Uh, it's kind of fairly straightforward in these, as you saw in the video, it's kind of, it's kind of understandable that people just copy other people who are doing better than them, but various next steps in the series of experiments kind of reveal the bits, um, uh, behavior that was a bit more uh, unexpected or unpredicted. Um, so in this, another way of uh, looking at the data is the correlations between the different attributes. And this is a common way that archaeologists actually um, analyze their data of real life arrowheads. So that here you can see correlation coefficients across the groups uh, between uh, the different attributes of the arrowheads, so height and width, height and thickness, height and shape. And as you would, as you might expect, there was very low correlations at 25 after the period of individual learning as everyone's kind of exploring on their own, converging on different peaks, so there's a um, breakdown in the association <coughs> between the attributes. Some people have tall and thin arrowheads, some people have short and thin arrowheads, depending on where they are in the landscape. And then at the end, after they've copied each other, the correlation shoots up because they're all um, copying each other and converging on the same uh, design. So suddenly everybody has a tall and thin uh, arrowhead, for example. But the interesting thing from here is that you can see color, which, if you remember, was neutral, had absolutely no effect on their um, score, on the fitness of the, the arrowhead, actually shows correlations pretty much indistinguishable from the shape, thickness, width, and height, which actually contributed to the score. So, and we also verified this, people seem to be copying things as a package. They weren't bothering to figure out which attributes actually um, change people's scores. They were just copying it as a package and color was kind of um, hitchhiking along with the other one. So this neutral color attribute uh, 
was copied just as faithfully as the other attributes. This kind of resembles this prestige bias. You just copy whatever someone like David Beckham or the best, the David Beckham of arrowhead makers in your group um, uh, is doing, and you copy it as a whole package rather than um, uh, going through the, um, the, the effort of figuring out which traits actually contribute to success. So we're interested in this. So we ran a few more experiments looking at this idea of prestige bias, which was introduced by Henrich and Gil White. So they argued, actually, we use all kinds of markers, minimal markers of prestige, like being looked at as shortcuts to who to copy. So in cases like this, you can see George Clooney looking longingly at Barack Obama there. So even though George Clooney is kind of high status, Barack Obama is even more high status. And the idea is that we use things like eye gaze, who people are looking at, as cues as to identifying um, particularly good models from whom to copy. Again, irrespective of whether they're do what they're doing is actually effective, um, we, um, we use these, these, these shortcuts. So in a study with Curtis Atkinson, uh, we repeated the Arrowhead study with the success information as before, but we added fictional looking times. So we had the score that people had, but then we added just nonsense um, fictional looking time, so number of seconds that other players accessed um, the other, or looked at the other um, players in the game. And we found, um, to my surprise at least, maybe not Curtis's, that looking times we used as often, if not more, than success information. Um, so this is a model comparison here, you can see um, BIC weight for those of you who understand these kinds of statistics. This is a 65% chance of the a model with just prestige looking times in being uh, fitting the data, and 35% of the success for the success um, uh, a model with just success or score in the data. So it's very difficult to tell between them, um, but people were basically using these nonsense looking looking times just as much as the success information. So it's very easy to get people to use um, minimal cues of prestige in these kinds of experiments. So participants often copy irrelevant cues that are associated with relevant cues. And this kind of fits with lots of work in developmental psychology that uh, kids will over imitate, um, uh, copy too much or slavishly um, uh, copy other people in various actual physical uh, tasks. Uh, the next set of studies looked at informational access costs. So in the previous experiments that I talked about, uh, copying was free, basically. If somebody wanted to copy you, as you saw in the video, you had no choice as to let them, letting them uh, copy you, and um, also you didn't even know if somebody else was, was copying you. So obviously in real life we know when other people are um, uh, interested in copying us or actually copying us, and sometimes we have a choice. Maybe a real-world example might be uh, your lawyer who has um, expert legal knowledge, and you can think of lawyers as setting a kind of cost on their expert legal knowledge, knowledge of the law, knowledge of previous cases, and so we give them money in exchange for access to their uh, legal knowledge. But also that's going to vary with the expertise or knowledge of the lawyer, so maybe if there's not such a good lawyer who doesn't have such good knowledge, then they can set uh, maybe a lower uh, cost to, for their legal knowledge. So we wanted to think about in the experiments how to add this in notion of informational access costs. So. Here we allow people to set prices in calories, sorry it's a bit small, set the price in calories that other players must pay in order to view your arrowhead design. So you can choose my arrowhead is worth say 100 calories or 200 calories uh, in order for other people to um, view it. And then you could copy and you could always see other people's um, prices that they'd set on their uh, arrowhead design. And then that actually, if somebody copies you, you actually got the calories that they um, that you set originally, and it got added to your score and deducted from uh, the player who's copying you uh, their score. So, kind of actual using calories as a currency of uh, access to information. So what happened here? Um, so we found this is uh, these bars show percentage of participants who um, uh, copied um, other players. This is three seasons we did, season one, season two with no access costs, the final season with access costs, and the dark bit of the bar is people who viewed the best, highest scoring player in the group, as you saw in the video, the hatch bar of players who viewed 
uh, not the best uh, player, another a different player in the group. So you can see in season one and season two, they were doing as we found in previous experiments. Lots of people were copying, mostly copying the best player. When we introduced the access costs, copying dramatically dropped and people tended to copy the not best person all the way through. As a result, this um, basically uh, removed the advantage of social learning. So here we have the red line. Are these social learners with the access costs in this last season? And the black line are the individual controls who couldn't copy at all. And you can see there's no increase yet at the end or throughout in the social learner. So social learning completely, uh, uh, removes, completely removes the advantage of social learning. And why was this? This is because people were setting ridiculously high <coughs> access costs, uh, or at least the best player in the group was setting ridiculously high access costs to access their um, arrowhead design given that they were the best person in the group. So they were setting costs of like 2,500 calories, people were getting up to a thousand calories each trial and so nobody was willing to pay this exorbitant cost. I was kind of hoping we'd get a kind of market information market with people setting their arrowheads competitively um, kind of not too high and, and get more um, uh, get more calories by selling their information to lots of people but no we just got the complete blockage of social learning uh, here. And obviously this is because of the structure of the the game that we were uh, setting up. So participants were re rewarded individually. I should have said before, you get paid proportion, in proportion to the number of calories you get in the experiment, um, in pounds or dollars, depending on where it was done. And so people were people knew that you know, if you were in ahead, you were just accumulating calories, and so why, um, uh, why sell your information? But this kind of issue, you can find in the ethnographic record as well. So some societies we know are quite egalitarian, so this is the Arca hunter-gatherer study by Barry Hewlett, where there's lots of sharing of knowledge, kids will, sh will share their different techniques, adults will let kids watch them, um, so lots of um, basically free exchange of information, uh, whereas other societies like the Irian Jaya, uh, studied by Dietrich Stout, uh, ads and makers will be um, protect their knowledge and you have to do an apprenticeship with kind of apprenticeship with a particular expert and follow them around and give them deference and material goods in exchange for access to their uh, to their expert knowledge so we find both these cases we find various cases in the ethnographic record uh, so that conclusion copying is I think um, which is a point that's not often uh, enough appreciated in the cultural evolution literature copying is often a cooperation problem and if you have no incentives to share knowledge, as you did, uh, as was the case in our experiments, then participants will just block, um, block all access. Of course, they will probably behave very differently if we change the incentive structure, um, but at least um, in this case, people are not uh, intrinsically altruistic um, from the get-go. Uh, the next set of studies uh, looked at individual variations. So, so far I've been showing you kind of group means or uh, means in whole conditions, and this ignores something that emerged through the experiments, which was that there was always quite substantial individual variation in how people play uh, the game. So in this version of the experiment, uh, we allow people to copy on every trial rather than just the last five hunts. So um, you could copy never, zero times, or you could copy on every single trial, so 30. And so this is frequency of copying, pay off, this payoff biased uh, social learning. Here's your score that you accumulate at um, uh, the end of the experiment. And each one of these is a participant in this particular experiment. And you can see there's variation, first of all. But you can also see curious patterns. So if I highlight these guys, these guys are copying most of the time on a majority of hunts and they're scoring quite well. So if that's the highest possible score, um, well actually that's the highest possible score, that's the best person in the group. These guys are all fairly close to the um, best player up here. But the curious thing is always these stubborn guys um, here in the experiments who copy very little and in some cases never copy at all. And we have training sessions to make sure that they know how to copy, that, that you can copy. These guys who don't copy much and consequently don't do very well um, in the game. And if they just copied a bit more, they could easily boost up into this orange uh, circle here, um, but um, they tend not to. And like I said, 
these calories get translated into actual money, so they're actually losing out on um, uh, several pounds by not uh, copying enough. And this has been found in quite a few other experiments that have been done by other groups using different tasks, um, uh, simpler tasks, more complex tasks, um, computer-based tasks, non-computer-based tasks, and different samples. Um, I say different samples, uh, actually all of the samples are from um, so-called weird uh, countries. So this is an acronym that uh, Joe Henrich and a few other people came up with where they criticized experiments, probably like our own, uh, for focusing exclusively or exclusively using participants from Western, educated, industrialized, rich, democratic or weird uh, countries. So um, Western European countries, uh, North America, Australia, and um, in many cases the, the criticisms are kind of general, but in this case, I think with our experiments, we're tapping into or interested in individual learning and social learning, and that translates um, kind of loosely onto a big dimension of cultural variation that cultural psychologists have um, been focusing on, uh, individualism, collectivism, and uh, so sort the of countries where we take our participants from, so Western Europe, North America, tend to be high in what psychologists call individualism, um, which, as the name suggests, might translate quite straightforwardly into a preference for individual learning. So it's possible that our um, uh, first individual variation in the experiments, but in particular the underutilization of social information in our, all of our experiments, could be because we're drawing participants from these individualistic uh, countries. So to test that, I teamed up with um, a Chinese psychologist uh, Lei Chang from the University of Hong Kong and we re-ran the Arrowhead game um, in uh, the English version in the UK and we translated it into Chinese and we re-ran exactly the same experiment but translated in participants from Hong Kong, so all students, uh, so students from Hong Kong and students from mainland uh, China, uh, as traditional a part of China uh, that Chang could uh, f uh, find, um, fairly close to Hong Kong, but um, uh, he, he argues it's as traditional and um, uh, unwesternized as, as, as possible. Um, and also Chinese students studying in Durham in the UK, and uh, we repeated it with uh, white British Durham uh, students uh, here. So four groups, and we did it over successive uh, seasons. So this is just replicate season one, season two. And in both we found that the uh, Chinese mainland participants, CM here, and this is frequency of copying, copied roughly twice as often as the white British participants here, and the Hong Kong, uh, uh, Chinese Hong Kong participants, and the Chinese immigrants in the UK were virtually statistically indistinguishable from the UK uh, participants. So it suggests that this low copying that we find in the experiments um, could be because our participants are curiously uh, weird, if you like, and uh, non-weird participants uh, tend to copy a lot more. They actually did better in the game as a result. Uh, and these are just the statistics showing that um, the big differences between the CM and the other groups um, but I guess most interesting is the actual, again, the individual variation underlying those bars that I just showed. You can see it's not like these are absolute group differences. There's always still individual variation within each of these categories, but there's just more high copiers in the Chinese mainland group than uh, the other three groups. And it's kind of interesting that the Hong Kong and the Chinese uh, immigrant students were indistinguishable to the UK rather than intermediate, uh, which we were kind of expecting. Uh, and there's a, there's a recent study um, just a couple of weeks ago that came out by Luke Glowacki and uh, Lucas Molleman where again they did a very similar experiment, frequency of social learning in a much simpler task, a different, uh, a different task. And they studied the Nyangatom uh, people in Ethiopia and um, within Nyangatom ethnic uh, group uh, you have pastoralists who tend to flocks of um, cows uh, you have urban dwellers living in the cities, and you have horticulturalists who grow small plots of uh, crops, small-scale uh, agriculture, and they found that the pastoralists copied 
uh, significantly more than the urban dwellers who copied more than the horticulturalists. So their explanation for this was that the pastoralists um, are very close-knit and they have to all come together to maintain their herds in the face of droughts or in the face of um, uh, raids from other groups and so that uh, need to stick together and coordinate and cooperate um, translates into higher social learning, higher willingness to uh, share uh, information uh, within, uh, within their group. Whereas horticulturalists do this on a household basis, so what you plant has no bearing on what other people plant. Um, and there's no very little competition for, uh, for land, no outside threats, and so people can be a lot more independent um, and uh, um, uh, yeah, a, lot, a lot more independent if you're a horticulturalist. So this kind of suggests that this uh, means of subsistence or social structure is shaping uh, social learning in that, uh, in the experiments. So there's both individual and cultural variation in learning strategies, and the origin of which um, is unclear. We're kind of talking about individualism, collectivism, these big cross-national uh, patterns. Of course, the other next question is where does individualism, collectivism uh, come from? I guess the Glowacki and Mollerman study is getting at its means of subsistence, its ways of living, which is affecting uh, these uh, psychological uh, processes. And finally, um, some work that's been done by Maxine Derrick, who's about to join us in Exeter, justify my inclusion in his inclusion in my talk. Um, so this is work that he's done uh, previously. So he's interested in uh, demography and um, population size and the structure of groups. This stems from work, again, by Joe Henrich um, a few years ago, where he argued, drawing on um, uh, drift models from biology that larger populations should support greater cultural complexity. Uh, he uses the example of Tasmania, which got cut off from the Australian mainland um, uh, 10,000 years ago or so and lost all kinds of complex tools like bone tools and fire and thick uh, winter clothing. Um, there are other examples like this by Klein and Boyd, where larger islands in the Pacific have more complex and larger toolkits than smaller islands in the Pacific, so um, where the size of the island is a proxy for population size. And the idea is that if you have more teachers in your group, then that prevents loss due to imperfect copying. So we're not, we're not perfect copiers. We often need to learn from multiple individuals, or if you've got a very small group and you're, you've got one expert basket maker, if they happen to fall off a cliff or have a heart attack, you've lost basket making. But if you're in a very large group, then you've got lots of expert basket makers and it creates a resilience within the group. So Maxim uh, tested this in, um, in the lab, because uh, obviously talking about Tasmania 10,000 years ago, it's very, um, lots of arguments over whether that hypothesis holds. Um, so he created tasks similar to um, the ones I've shown you already, where First, people had to make in groups a, an arrowhead by tracing around these dots. And this was a simple task um, because there was an uh, optimal combination of connections between the dots um, and you just had to find what exactly that, that was. He started the groups off with a certain um, arrowhead, with a kind of moderately good arrowhead here. And then the groups were in um, group sizes of two, four, 8 and 16, and you can see here the groups of 2 and 4 just about managed to maintain this moderately complex arrowhead. The groups of 8 and 16 um, boosted their arrowheads and um, uh, generated a much, um, uh, much more complex arrowhead and increased their score. And this was similar to my uh, arrowhead studies, you had lots of trials where you could learn from each other. Um, and, and uh, uh, view other people's um, uh, scores as well. So very, very similar thing there. And then he was interested in more complex, a more complex traits so and manipulating the complexity of the, the trait here. Uh, fishing nets where you had to put different things in the, um, uh, the, 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 the connecting points and then draw crosses in certain things um, in certain places in the fishing net. And there was quite a complicated fitness set of fit, fitness functions that translated the fishing net into the score. And here, the groups, the very small groups of two or four, um, basically lost all of their complexity. Their fishing nets got a lot worse over time. This is in the last, um, uh, last trial, I should say. And the groups of six, uh, sorry, eight and 16 maintained this 
um, moderately complex uh, uh, this this complex uh, trait. So here, consistent with Joe Henrich's argument, the size of the group is a crucial factor in maintaining complex uh, technology, irrespective of the uh, social learning biases or how people are learning from each other. These bigger groups tend to maintain more complex uh, technology, at least. And this study, a um, uh, nice study that Maxime did uh, uh, very recently, built on this idea of uh, fitness, uh, multimodal fitness landscapes, where he had almost different lineages of traits. So. This wasn't um, technology really, it's kind of potions that you have to combine in different combinations and you have one lineage of potions, so if you put these three together then you get this uh, purple thing and then you have to combine that with two other ingredients to produce that and that's combined with these two to produce that, you get a lineage up here, then you've got another lineage of, of ingredients here, but then at this point you have to combine the product of this lineage, this, um, this one, with the product of this lineage, this one with the red box around it, um, and so you need to basically work on both of these lineages of, um, of knowledge, cultural lineages, and then combine them at the end. So what he found was that partially connected groups, so groups that can work mostly on their own for a, long, a while, and then can view each other's um, uh, ingredients or uh, products, actually outperformed uh, cases where everybody could see everybody else's um, uh, uh, products at all times. So the explanation here is that the partially connected groups, when they're disconnected from everyone else, some will go along this lineage, some will go along this lineage, and then when they're brought together, then they combine their products of these lineages, whereas the fully connected groups, they all kind of converge on one single lineage and nobody ever explores this alternative lineage. So you can see at the end the partially connected groups end up vastly outperforming the fully connected groups. So again this is keying into this idea that the demographic structure of human groups, their size, their interconnectedness um, strongly affects cultural evolution aside from what individuals are learning from, uh, from each other, the kind of biases that people employ. Uh, so these are a set of uh, conclusions I guess or uh, lines of inquiry that various people have been pursuing using these uh, experiments. Just a couple of minutes uh, finishing up, drawing it back, back to the archaeological record, I guess. So I started off by saying these arrowheads, and we took them from Mike O'Brien's collection of artifacts that were actually dug out of the ground. So how can we actually use them to inform an archaeological uh, case study? So going back to uh, North America, it's a study by Bettinger and Erkins with actual um, arrowhead designs in two different regions of the United States, southwestern United States, one in uh, eastern Nevada, sorry, central Nevada, one in eastern California, so fairly close uh, to each other, around the same time period, 300 to 600 AD, and they noticed curious differences between these two sites in what were very similar, otherwise similar arrowheads made out of the same material, probably used to kill the same kind of things. Um, but in California, the arrowhead designs had lots of variation. They were very diverse. So some were long and thin, some were long and thick. There was no connection between the different um, dimensions. In Nevada, there was very little variation. So lots of them were long and thin, lots of them were short and fat. So lots of high correlations between the attributes and translating that into these inter-attribute uh, correlations again um, we see low correlations in California and high correlations in Nevada so this probably looks uh, familiar because I showed a similar thing from the results of our experiments earlier uh, where we found again low correlations at the end of the individual learning phase and high correlations at the end of the experiment where people could copy um, other people. So, in a sense, we were kind of trying to replicate Bettinger and Erkin's actual real-life archaeological data in uh, the lab and testing a hypothesis that in California there was more individual learning, as in our um, individual learning parts of our experiment, leading to low correlations, and in Nevada there was more conservative, if you like, success bias social learning, which generates high correlations between the attribute values. So 
maybe Nevadan hunters use more success by social learning, Californians use more individual learning, maybe. Um, this is where experiments, the value of experiments comes in, I guess. This only works if there's this multimodal adaptive landscape. If we have a unimodal landscape, if there's a single best possible arrowhead design, everyone just converges on that, irrespective of whether you can copy others or not. It suggests that maybe there was a multimodal landscape underlying these actual arrowheads from the archaeological record. Some experiments, experimental archaeology experiments, have tried firing arrowheads of different dimensions into carcasses and trying to map the actual, um, multi, the actual fitness landscape of real artifacts, finding interesting trade-offs between, say, arrowhead length and thickness, maybe suggesting there's there is, there is this multimodal landscape perhaps underlying these arrowheads. For example, thin narrow points have greater penetrating power, but wide thick points create a larger wound that bleeds more easily. Mm. I grew some of these experiments, but it kind of suggests that there are these trade-offs. And maybe drawing on the experiments, we might suggest differences between the sites which caused these differences in turn in uh, learning dynamics. Maybe there was a higher cost of individual learning in prehistoric Nevada, if you remember, when we introduced a cost of individual learning, we got more social learning in our experiment. Or maybe it's these informational access costs. Maybe it's something about the social groups in California was um, means that they had higher informational access costs. Obviously, it's highly speculative and not suggesting this is the explanation for this pattern. But experiments allow us to manipulate things like um, uh, the shape of the fitness landscape in order to try and get towards an explanation. Um, just uh, basically re reiterating this idea that experiments really need to be combined with models, observational studies, and historical uh, studies as well. Okay, so I'll end there and thank uh, my funders. Um, and if you're interested in cultural evolution, uh, my book is um, available uh, to read a bit further. Thank you.